all right so a very good evening everyone so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator so in this particular session i'll be doing the previous year questions mainly covering the ecgs so ecg is one important topic definitely you need to revise in the last part of your preparation and in the previous year exams of neat pg there were some like two questions or one question on the ecg that was there definitely and some papers were there where you were having even three to four ecgs also so what i tried to do is i tried to collect all the ecgs of the last 10 years of the neat pg the inicet then previously like we used to have a separate exam uh, for pga chandigarh so the ecgs which were given in the pga chandigarh exam so all these ecgs i tried to collect and uh, i will try to discuss all the ecgs so there are nearly around 50 to 60 ecgs which i quickly rush through because already you have adequate knowledge on the ecg so i just quickly rush through all the ecgs like which were asked previously so having said this right so let me just quickly tell you uh, what is going on on an academy so on an academy you have the two subscriptions one is plus and as well as iconic subscriptions and iconic subscriptions wherein you will have an academy and as well as the prep ladder and there are two important batch courses which are going on one is fmg batch course and the other one is the final booster batch that is for neat pg exam and this the fmg batch course this particular batch course are, has started on the february 10th and this particular batch course the duration is totally five months in which it is being divided into two modules module one it is like february and as well as april from february to april where you will be covered the entire theory portion of all the 19 subjects and from april to june that will be module two wherein you will have practice question revision for all the subjects with previous year questions and as well as the image based questions okay so the the course is around 15,300 and in which if you use my code that is med10 you can get 20% off on your subscriptions and the another important batch course is the final booster batch this particular batch course will definitely useful will be definitely useful for the students who are appearing for the neat pg exam that is on march 5th okay right so these are the two important batch courses which are going on and you can use my code that is med10 wherein you will get an additional discount on your subscriptions right so having said this let us start with the today's session right so this is the first question just give me a minute right so this is the first question this ecg is from 35 year old male type 1 diabetic patient and he presents feeling generally unwell with abdominal pain and as well as dyspnea and the ecg is given like what do you think is the diagnosis acute inferior wall mi hyperkalemia digoxin toxicity hypokalemia right so yes can anyone answer what exactly is the problem in this uh, type 1 diabetic patient so if you take the ecg features here right it is suggestive of the hyperkalemia now what are the points uh, in favor of the hyperkalemia you have the presence of the tall tented t waves right the presence of tall tented t waves all these are suggestive of the presence of the hyperkalemia and in hyperkalemia the earliest ecg change will be the tall tented t waves now if you take this uh, tall t waves there are two conditions where you can have this tall t waves okay so what are those conditions where you can have tall t waves is one is in patients with hyperkalemia where you will have tall tented t wave and the other condition is in patients with acute mi also you will have tall t wave but here it will be broad tall t wave okay and the appearance of this broad tall t wave in case of acute mi this will be the earliest ecg change in mi right this will be the earliest ecg change in mi okay right so having said this uh, this is the ecg of your hyperkalemia now let me quickly tell you what are the abnormality of the ecg changes in digoxin toxicity now can anyone quickly tell me what is the most common arrhythmia that you will come across in digoxin toxicity any one of you most common arrhythmia that you will come across in case of digoxin toxicity any one of you please right 
right so the most common arrhythmia that you come across in case of the digoxin toxicity will be ventricular bigemini it is not vt most common most common is ventricular bigemini and followed by that you can have all the other arrhythmias you can have vt and you can also have vf right and not only tachy arrhythmias you can also have bradi arrhythmias in digoxin toxicity you can also have bradi arrhythmias what are those bradi arrhythmias you can have first degree av block second degree av block and as well as the third degree av block but which type of av block that you will not see the arrhythmias not seen in digoxin toxicity not seen in digoxin toxicity are atrial fibrillation then atrial flutter and mobids type 2 av block right mobids type 2 av block these are the arrhythmias that you will not see in case of digoxin toxicity otherwise you will come across all the arrhythmias in case of digoxin toxicity right then now having discussed about the first ecg now we'll move on to the next ecg right so you see this question here ecg of a 14 year old female who presents following an episode of palpitations and associated dizziness diagnosis of the ecg is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia atrial fibrillation aortic stenosis wpw syndrome so what is the presentation of the patient palpitations and there is dizziness now can anyone quickly answer this question no 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 it is not psvt why are you in a hurry of uh, answering the questions so just go through the ecg properly now if at all if it is like psvt paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia in psvt what is that you should have you should have narrow complexes now if you closely observe the complexes in these patients they are not narrow complexes the qrs complexes whatever you are having they are wide qrs complexes right they are wide qrs complexes next to the wide qrs complexes the other important thing uh, is if you clearly or if you closely observe you take the pr interval the pr interval is being shortened and upon that you can see the slurring of the qrs complex and that particular slurring of the qrs complex is nothing but the delta wave so all that points are in favor of what all that points are in favor of your wpw syndrome okay so this is the ecg of wpw syndrome ulf parkinson's white syndrome why it is not paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia because in psvt you have narrow complexes but whereas here you have wide complexes then how do you identify the ecg of atrial fibrillation please remember in patients with atrial fibrillation the rhythm is irregularly irregular rhythm now let me show you the ecgs of all these options okay so you take the first one that is psvt so in case of psvt like how should be the complexes you see this is how the complexes will be that is narrow qrs complexes will be there regular rhythm and tachycardia will be there this will be the ecg of your psvt paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and what was the other option that is atrial fibrillation see in atrial fibrillation one of the very very important finding is the rhythm so in case of atrial fibrillation the rhythm will be irregularly irregular rhythm but if you take the ecg like what i have shown in the clinical scenario the rhythm was the regular rhythm let me show you once again so if you go back to this ecg if you see the rhythm the rhythm is regular rhythm here so this will rule out your atrial fibrillation right and what was the other option the other option was the aortic stenosis and in patients with aortic stenosis like what is that you will have you will have the features of left ventricular hypertrophy so in left ventricular hypertrophy you should have the sokolov-leone criteria being satisfied now what is this particular sokolov-leone criteria in case of left ventricular hypertrophy sokolov-leone criteria will be sv1 that is amplitude of sv1 plus lv6 if it is there if it, if you calculate this one second okay sv1 plus rv6 that should be more than 35 mm right that should be more than 35 mm that is what is suggest you of your left ventricular hypertrophy and that is what you will have in patients with the aortic stenosis okay so this ecg is not suggestive of aortic stenosis which i have shown you in the clinical scenario which is suggestive of your wpw syndrome where you have an accessory bundle and that name of the accessory bundle is bundle of kent okay now what is the condition where you have bundle of james yes what is that uh, condition where you have bundle of james as an accessory pathway 
right then okay now you see the next uh, clinical scenario and ecg these ecgs were taken from a 40 year old male who presented with 60 minutes history of central chest pain right 60 minutes history of the central chest pain okay right then on arrival to the emergency department he was pain free four minutes later he developed further intense chest pain and repeat ecg was performed which vessel is blocked in this patient left anterior descending artery left circumflex artery right coronary artery left anterior descending artery and left circumflex artery right jj this particular session will be there for nearly around one to one and a half hour okay yes now which particular vessel is blocked in this patient? Right. It is not just only left anterior descending artery. Okay. If you clearly see here, like what are the ECG changes uh, suggestive of this particular ECG changes? They are suggestive of both. That is the anterior wall MI. Right. And not only anterior wall MI, you also have the lateral wall MI. One AVL V5, V5, V6 also, you have ST segment elevation. Okay. So ST segment elevation is there in one AVL V5, V6 and as well as V1 to V4. So when ST segment elevation is there in uh, uh, V1 to V4 and one AVL V5, V6, that is suggestive of both anterior wall MI and as well as lateral wall MI. So the answer is the left anterior descending artery and as well as the left circumflex artery in this particular question right now having discussed so it is not just only LAD by seeing LAD don't jump onto LAD immediately as a first option the correct answer is the fourth option right now you see the next important clinical scenario the following ECG is taken from a 71 year old male who presented with several episodes of ischemic sounding chest pain on a background of known ischemic heart disease Okay, on a background of known ischemic cardiac disease. What is the next step in the management? Options are requires urgent thrombolysis, requires urgent PCI, need serial ECGs and comparison with the prior ECGs, ignore because they are artifacts. So what do you think is the correct answer in this question? Yes. Hmm, what is the correct answer in this question? Right. Now, what is that you are observing here? If you clearly see, you are observing the presence of ventricular premature contractures. Okay. You are observing the ventricular premature contractures. Okay. So, the ventricular premature contractures, that is one important, that too with the background history of ischemic cardiac disease. So, these are the precursors of, these are the precursor ECG changes of the MI. See, what are the risk factors for coronary artery disease in this patient? Number one, age, 71 year old. Next, the other important risk factor is ischemic sounding chest pain. Third important risk factor is background history of ischemic cardiac disease. So, there are totally three risk factors in this patient, right? Now, this patient is having the ECG feature suggests your ventricular premature contractures. That might be a precursor for the development of NMI. So what does this patient require is needs serial ECGs and comparison with the prior ECGs. So the, this particular patient requires serial ECGs to look for if there is any development of the ST segment elevation or the tall T wave. Okay. So the answer is the option C. Now, it is only after the development of MI, for suppose, if the patient has entered into a stage of MI, then these patients, they require urgent PCI or thrombolysis. Until the patient did not develop MI, we don't do PCI or thrombolysis. So, that is why your option A and B are the incorrect. Now, you see the next question. Following are the features of raised intracranial pressure, right? Following are the ECG features of raised intracranial pressure, except... Right? All these are the features of the ECG features of raised intracranial pressure, except options are widespread giant T wave inversions, short QT shortening, bradycardia, ST segment elevation or depression. So what do you think is the correct answer here? 
very good dr ravi so in patients with raised intracranial pressure what is that you will have is you will have qt prolongation the remaining all ecg features will be there in case of raised intracranial pressure that is giant t wave inversions will be there and that too global that means all the leads you will have t wave inversions and that too wide next qt prolongation will be there and there will be bradycardia now why is this particular bradycardia is due to activation of the cushing's reflex and st segment elevation or depression will be there these are the ecg features of raised intracranial pressure now let me show you the ecg of raised intracranial pressure you see this now you can observe very clearly that there is giant t wave inversion and that to global except your avr avr it will be opposite to all other leads so this is what is your giant t wave inversions and if you take the qt interval the qt interval is being prolonged right bradycardia is not very significantly present the heart rate is something around 60 here but so these are the ecg features of raised intracranial pressure they you will not have qt shortening what you will have is qt prolongation so these are the ecg features of raised intracranial pressure now now this is one of the difficult ecg this was given in pj chandigarh hmm? this was the ecg which was given in the pj chandigarh when inict exam was not there there used to be an exam called a separate entrance for pj chandigarh now this was the ecg given in that particular exam 35 year old male who presented to the emergency department complaining of palpitations right dyspnea and light headedness for the preceding hour he has no known past medical history vital signs blood pressure is 115 by 65 saturation respiratory rate is 20 saturation 98 percentage at room air temperature 36.6 so what do you think is the diagnosis in this patient svt with aberrancy atrial fibrillation with wpw syndrome polymorphic ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation right so here the correct answer is the atrial fibrillation right the atrial fibrillation with wpw syndrome now why is that let me explain to you and i will show you the ecgs of all other options also now first of all okay what is the rhythm strip rhythm strip is lead to now whenever you look for a rhythm strip how is the rhythm if you very clearly see here right if you very clearly see here the rr interval it is varying rr interval so when you are having a varying rr interval that is suggest you of atrial fibrillation among the options which has been given to you now apart from that you take the pqrst now when you are using the word atrial fibrillation you don't have the p wave you don't have the p wave what you have is the fibrillatory waves but if you take the qrs complex so how is the qrs complex here the qrs complex it is wide right it is the wide qrs complex and apart from that like what is that you are observing in the qrs complex is you have slight slurring of the qrs complex right you have slight slurring of the qrs complex and this particular slight slurring of the qrs complex this is what is nothing but your delta wave hmm, this is what is nothing but your delta wave which is clearly seen in patients with the wpw syndrome so the two points number one irregularly irregular rhythm with the absence of p wave and having fibrillatory wave atrial fibrillation number two wide qrs complex with slurring of the qrs complex that is your delta wave which is nothing but wpw syndrome so now if you clearly see this is the ecg of atrial fibrillation with wpw syndrome now what about svt with aberrancy when you are using the word svt actually in supraventricular tachycardia there should be narrow complexes but when you are using the word aberrancy the word aberrancy means there will be bundle branch block okay svt with the bundle branch block now let me show you the ecg of svt with aberrancy so if you take the ecg of svt with aberrancy you see here okay so svt supraventricular tachycardia what should be there the rhythm should be regular rhythm that is one point now when we are using the word aberrancy that means there should be a bundle branch block by seeing this particular ecg which bundle branch block can you assume right so now can anyone tell me which bundle branch block right which bundle branch block is this particular patient having any one of you please which bundle branch block is this patient having yes now if you see the right very good dark night so you are having the rbbb pattern because you have m in 
your r r wave is m pat m shaped in v1 and if you take the s wave it is like w pattern so which is nothing but your marrow that is a mnemonic for your right bundle branch block so this is what is nothing but your svt with aberrancy with right bundle branch block now what was our other option the other option in the question was polymorphic ventricular tachycardia now let me show you the ecg of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia so the point is very important when we are using the word polymorphic that means they are the one with variable morphologies okay the qrs complexes of variable morphologies so you can see here this is the rhythm strip lead 2 is considered as rhythm strip and you can see the qrs complexes they are all of variable morphologies so this is what is nothing but polymorphic ventricular tachycardia right next what was our the other option the other option was the ventricular fibrillation so in ventricular fibrillation like how will be the ecg of ventricular fibrillation you don't have an identifiable qrs complexes right you don't have an identifiable qrs complexes okay you can see that here there are no identifiable qrs complexes and that is what is the ecg of ventricular fibrillation okay right so now after having discussed about the atrial fibrillation with wpw syndrome now we'll move on to the next question now this is the question which has been asked in aims right so prior to your inict exam we used to have a separate entrance for aims exam so this was the question which was asked in the aims exam now ecg is from a 69 year old male who had a dual chamber pacemaker earlier in the day he complained to the ward staff of pain at the insertion site right pain at the insertion site and you have been asked to review him his bp temperature saturation respiratory rate are all within the normal limits ecg was performed and this is how the ecg shows now tell me what is this suggestive of properly placed pacemaker leads okay the patient is having the past history of having okay the dual chamber pacemaker is there the options are properly placed placed pacemaker leads leads misplaced patient developed acute mi normal ecg so what do you think is this suggestive of very good dark knight so dark knight has answered it correctly that is leads misplaced now let me try to explain to you how to identify an ecg with a pacemaker always you look for a rhythm strip or any strip whenever you are having this particular type of straight lines before the PQRST complexes. Hmm? If you are having these particular straight lines, vertical line before the PQRST complexes, you have to assume that this is a pacemaker rhythm, right? This is a pacemaker rhythm. Now, now, how can you tell that this is a, a ECG with being leads misplaced? Now, how can you tell? So. First of all, you should identify it is a pacemaker rhythm. How can you identify that? That is by small vertical black lines, small black vertical lines that I have highlighted here. Now, how can you tell that the leads have been mis misplaced? Let me tell you. Now, for suppose you take the dual chamber pacemaker. Where do we place this dual chamber pacemaker in right atrium and as well as the right ventricle? That is where you place this dual chamber pacemaker. You see here. So, this is your right atrial lead. Right, this is your right atrial lead and this is your right ventricular lead. Now, whenever you get this particular the dual chamber pacemaker ECG, so which particular chamber is getting paced first? The right ventricle is getting paced first. When right ventricle is getting paced first, what should be the ECG looking like? The ECG will be looking like LBBB pattern because the right ventricle is contracting first after the right ventricle the left ventricle will contract later so you get a pattern of lbbb pattern if it is a properly placed okay you see here this is your classical this is your classical lbbb pattern so you have deep and broad s wave in lead v1 and broad and tall r wave in the v6 Okay, and that too of M shape, which is nothing but the mnemonic of your Williams. So, this is what is your classical properly placed dual chamber pacemaker ECG rhythm. But if you take the ECG rhythm here, now please tell me what is the pattern in this particular ECG? Is it RBBB pattern 
or is it ABBB pattern? What is that you are seeing here? So if you see clearly here, what is that you are seeing is you are seeing the RBBB pattern. So you can see here, this is what is your RSR pattern. And this is what, where is your lead V6? Yeah, this is your lead V6. So in lead V6, you can see deep, broad, S wave. Okay. So this is what is your classical RBBB. Hmm? This is what is your classical RBBB. That means what has happened here? The leads have been misplaced. Now, how do you think the leads have been misplaced? We don't know. The leads might be misplaced through the patent foramen oval. The leads might be misplaced through atrial septal defect. The leads might be misplaced by ventricular septal defect. The leads might be misplaced by septal perforation. Anything can happen. So this is how the ECG of leads misplaced will be in case of dual chamber pacemaker. Just give me a quick thumbs up if you have understood the concept of leads misplaced. Yes, just give me a quick thumbs up if you have understood the concept of leads misplaced. And if you did not, please let me know. I can explain you once again. Right. Now, we'll move on to the next uh, ECG pattern. Okay. Now, yes, you see the next question. Now, 84-year-old male patient complaining of the general lethargy, nausea and several episodes of diarrhea and dizziness. Yeah, Ravi, once again, Ravi, I'll explain to you. I'll, one, just give me a minute, I'll explain to you. Okay. Past history of atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and hypertension. Medications include aspirin, ACE inhibitors, statin, sulfonylurea, and digoxin. He is conscious, vague, but oriented. And his blood pressure is 112 systolic. ECG, like what exactly is the diagnosis? Right, a Kritika single. See, you have to look for the rhythm strip first. Hmm? That is the first lead that you have to look for. Rate, rhythm and everything. And then after that, you should look for all the leads for the individual waves. Right, very good dark night. So this particular patient is having the complete heart block. So what are the points in favor of your complete heart block? You see, you don't have a particular morphology of the PQRST being followed. You don't have the PQRST being followed. So this is your QRS complex, right? And this is a P wave. And again, you have a P wave. And again, you have a QRS complex. Then you have a T wave, you have a P wave, again P wave, again QRS complex. So this is the classical ECG of the complete heart block. Now the point is, like what would be the cause of the complete heart block in this patient? The cause of the complete heart block in this particular patient is, might be due to drug toxicity secondary to your digoxin. The patient is on digoxin. So he might have developed the digoxin toxicity and lining up in complete heart block. Okay, that is only an assumption. It might be or it may not be. But the assumption is because of digoxin toxicity, the individual might have developed this complete heart block. Now, always the ECGs of the other options also are very, very important. First degree heart block, morbid type 1, morbid type 2. How will be the ECG changes, right? So, let me quickly recap. So, in case of the first degree AV block, in case of first degree AV block, what is that you will notice is, you will notice the presence of the prolonged PR interval prolonged PR interval and how much will be that? That will be more than 210 milliseconds. That will be your first degree AV block. Then Mobitz type 1 AV block. Mobitz type 1 AV block, there will be progressive prolongation of the PR interval. So you can see here, there is progressive prolongation of the PR interval and you have a P wave and drop in the QRS complex. Okay, so progressive prolongation of the PR interval with drop in the QRS complex. So that is what is your Mobit type 1 which is also called Winky Bax. Then what is Mobit type 2? Mobit type 2, you will have a constant PR interval. Right, you have a constant PR interval in case of Mobit type 2. But you have a P wave which is not followed by the QRS complex. That is what is your Mobitz type 2. So Mobitz type 2 constant PR interval and subsequently you have a P wave and there is no QRS complex. So that is what is your Mobitz type 2 AV block. And complete heart block, just now I have discussed that there is no association with your P wave and as well as the QRS complex. Okay. So having said about all the AV blocks, we will move on to the next ECG. Right. Please answer this. Yes. Now, this is another important question. 
uh, which was asked in your AIMS exam. A 59 year old male who presented to the emergency department following two episodes of syncopal episode. He had a long history of infrequent unexplained syncope over the prior 15 years. His only past medical history is diet control type 2 diabetes mellitus and he was taking no regular medications. And ECG is as follows. Like what is the diagnosis? Bifascicular block, trifascicular block, left anterior fascicular block, left posterior fascicular block. Yes. Hmm, what is this particular ECG suggestive of? Okay, now I'll just zoom this ECG. Please try to answer this. Right, if anyone can answer, I'll be very happy. And this was the previously uh, asked in the AIMS exam. So definitely in the NEET PG, like you did, will not be any hesitance to ask this particular question again. Very good, uh, SNE Joe. The answer is the bifascicular block. Now, how to identify the bifascicular block? See, bifascular blocks involve now, what is this bifascular block? Let me tell you. See, now, if you take the conducting system of the heart. See, this is the conducting system of the heart. Like, you have right bundle branch. Okay. And for the left bundle branch, you have the two uh, branches. That is left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle. Okay. Now, when you are using the word bifascular block, there will be right bundle branch block. Along with that, either left anterior fascicle will be blocked or left posterior fascicle will be blocked. That is what is called bifascular block. Okay, I'll repeat again. Along with the right bundle branch block, either of it, either there will be left anterior fascicular block or left posterior fascicular block. That is called your bifascular block. But what is the most common pattern? The most common pattern is along with right bundle branch block, if there is left anterior fascicular block, that will be the most common bifascular block, right? Along with right bundle branch block, the most common will be left anterior fascicular block. Now, how to identify the ECG of the bifascular block? How to identify the ECG of bifascular block? So, how to identify is, first and foremost, very important, definitely, you will have the ECG of RBBB pattern. You will have the ECG of RBBB pattern. So, you can see very clearly here, that is RSR pattern is there. Okay, and along with that, there will be left axis deviation or right axis deviation will be there. So this is how you will identify the bifascular block. Now, I'll ask you a quick question. In this ECG which has been given to you, is it right axis deviation or a left axis deviation? Yes, is it a right axis deviation or a left axis deviation? Yes, any one of you? Now, so definitely you are having right bundle branch block, no doubt in that. But tell me, what is the axis? Is it right axis deviation or left axis deviation? So, your lead 1 is positive, lead 2 is negative. So, when lead 1 is positive and lead 2 is negative, so this will be left axis deviation. Hmm, this is not normal axis, this is left axis deviation. So, along with RBBB, you are having left axis deviation, which is suggestive of the bifascular block. Okay, right. Now, this is not normal, this is left axis deviation, right. So, having said about the ECG changes of the bifascular block, then we'll move on to the next ECG. I hope everyone is clear and has understood this uh, bi bifascular block. So what is bifascular block? Along with RBBB, there should be either left hand axis deviation or right axis deviation should be there. Now we'll move on to the next ECG again. Right. Yes. 86 year old male referred by his general practitioner with worsening renal failure. He has a history of atrial fibrillation, right? History of atrial fibrillation with bradycardia for which he has he had a permanent pacemaker insertion for which he had a permanent pacemaker insertion. His medications include metoprolol. Interpret this particular ECG. Pacemaker failure to capture. Second option, maybe lead fracture. Third option, maybe drug toxicity. All the above. What do you think is the correct answer? Very good, Ravi. The correct answer is the all the above. See, the patient is on pacemaker. The pacemaker has to generate the rhythm, but you don't have the rhythm which is being continued. What actually is the patient having? The patient is having complete heart block. So when the patient is having complete heart block, what does that mean? The pacemaker might have been failed. 
or the pacemaker leads might have been failed and the patient is on metoprolol the patient might have been taken excessive dose of metoprolol and why is he taking metoprolol he is taking metoprolol for this atrial fibrillation so there might be overdose of metoprolol causing complete heart block so the correct answer here is all of the above now what do you understand by the word lead fracture now this particular pacemakers they will have i'm sorry right this particular pacemakers they have the leads right these are the leads so these are the leads which will get inserted into the myocardium and if this particular leads are fractured then also there will be pacemaker failure so the correct answer in, in this patient is all of the above right now having discussed about the pacemaker so i have discussed two ecgs related to pacemaker okay right and these were all the previously year asked questions right so this was the neat pg exam this was asked in 2020 right this ecg is from 47 year old female she presents with acute onset severe dyspnea her vital signs are blood pressure 95 by 42 respiratory rate 30 saturation 88 percentage what would be the probable diagnosis congestive heart failure pulmonary embolism copd acute mi right now let me just zoom this ecg for you yeah please answer this yes any one of you quickly Now, so if you closely observe here, yes, any one of you, make a quick attempt. Right, so you take the clinical scenario. What is the clinical scenario? Acute onset dyspnea. It is not acute MI. It is not acute MI. So the patient is having acute onset dyspnea. Among the options which has been given to you, like which conditions will present with acute onset dyspnea? Congestive heart failure causing pulmonary edema and pulmonary embolism. These are the two options where they can present with acute onset dyspnea, right? Now, the point is... You take the ECG changes. What are the ECG changes? Number one, the patient is having sinus tachycardia, right? Why? Because the heart rate is around 100 per minute. Okay, that is one thing. Next, the patient is having an RBBB pattern. The patient is having an RBBB pattern. And the patient is also having right ventricular strain pattern. So how can you tell that there is right ventricular strain pattern? Because there is a T wave inversion in the right sided leads. And the other point is the presence of S1. Your Q is not there very significantly, but T3. S1, Q3, T3. So all these are the points suggestive of your pulmonary embolism. So this is not your acute MI. This is the ECG suggestive of pulmonary embolism. So this was the recently asked the knee PG uh, exam question. Right. Now, now you take in COPD. What will be the ECG changes in COPD? In COPD, the ECG changes will be the presence of low voltage complexes. Why? Because in patients with the COPD, you have one of the component is like emphysema. In patients with emphysema, you have large voluminous lungs and these large voluminous lungs will overlap the heart and thereby the conduction of the impulses to the surface of the chest will be reduced. So you get low voltage complexes in COPD, right? This will be the ECG changes in COPD. And the other important ECG changes, very good, uh, uh, Hashirama, okay? Yes, the another one is MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. What is multifocal atrial tachycardia where you have more than or equal to three different P waves. Along with that, heart rate will be more than 100 per minute. Okay, that is what is your MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. That is another important ECG pattern in patients with the COPD, right? Now, after having discussed about the ECG of your pulmonary embolism, now let me show you another ECG which has been asked. So, 53-year-old male presenting with central chest pain for two hours. Central chest pain for two hours ongoing at the time of recording diagnosis of the ecg left ventricular hypertrophy posterior wall mi prince metal angina wpw syndrome hmm, i'll just zoom this ecg for you hmm, the options are left ventricular hypertrophy posterior wall mi prince metal angina wpw syndrome uh, no 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 it is not wpw syndrome hmm, it is not wpw syndrome no, it is not WPW syndrome. Why are you in a favor of WPW syndrome? Your PR interval is normal. Hmm? Your PR interval is normal here. Hmm? The PR interval, if you take, so this is nearly around 200, hmm, nearly around 200 milliseconds. Okay, it is not 
your WPW syndrome. It is not Prince metal angina also. Hmm? It is not your Prince metal angina also. Why? Because in Prince metal angina, what you get is ST segment elevation you get in Prince metal angina. Now, if you take these leads, do you have any ST segment elevation in these leads? No, not at all. So, Prince metal angina is ruled out. Then, what is this ECG suggest you of? This ECG suggests you of your posterior wall MI. Now, how to identify the ECG of the posterior wall MI? So, posterior wall MI, you will have ST segment depression, flat ST segment depression from V1 to V3, right? Flat ST segment depression from V1 to V3 and your R wave will be more than compared to that of S wave in lead V1 or V2. Okay, that means R by S ratio will be more than 1. Mm, R by S ratio will be more than 1, either in lead V1 or V2. So, this is what is suggestive of your posterior wall MI. Okay, so the patient is having posterior wall MI, it is not your Prince metal angina. In Prince metal angina, you will have ST segment elevation. And that to this ST segment elevation in case of Prince metal angina, they are mostly present in the right sided leads. Why? Because in Prince metal angina, the most common vessel which will undergo transient coronary vasospasm is the right coronary artery. So, right coronary artery, it is your right sided leads. That means mainly in lead 2, 3 and as well as AVF, you will have ST segment elevation in case of Prince metal angina. So, this is the ECG suggests you of your posterior wall MI. It is not your Prince metal angina, right? So, we will move on to the next question. right yes please answer this this is almost like a repeat question so one time they have asked like ecg changes of okay by seeing the clinical scenario itself you should be able to answer this question 22 year old female uh, presents with sudden onset severe occipital headache ecg gives a suspicion of widespread ischemia subarachnoid hemorrhage hypokalemia hypocalcemia now i'll just zoom this ecg you can answer this Widespread ischemia, subarachnoid hemorrhage, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. Now, so if you clearly see here, what is that you are observing? You are observing that there is widespread or you are having a global T wave inversion. Right? Global T wave inversion. And that too, the patient is having a severe occipital headache. Okay, severe occipital headache. Okay, so this is suggestive of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, this is the ECG feature of raised intracranial pressure. So, ECG features of raised intracranial pressure is a very, very important question. Two times it has been asked. Hmm? In the recent times, two times it has been asked. Okay, so what all we have discussed, there will be global T wave inversion, then QT prolongation will be there and bradycardia will be there. And ST segment elevation or depression will be there. These are the ECG features of raised intracranial pressure. Okay. So, this is your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Right. Now, having said this case about this, we will move on to the next one. Okay. So, this is the ECG which has been asked in the INICT exam. 51 year old female who presented with chronic vomiting. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis and history of rheumatoid arthritis and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Her medications include Sotalol and Rivaroxaban. This patient had a sudden cardiac death after a while and what do you think is this particular due to? Right. Very good uh, Kanika. So and as well as Sanamemon. Hmm? The correct answer is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Now how can you tell that the patient might have developed polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, right? Because if you take the QT interval, right, the QT interval is prolonged in this patient, right? The QT interval is prolonged. Now, when the QT interval is being prolonged, this particular patients with long QT interval, they go into a state of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is nothing but torsades D-pointers. And secondary to your polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, they can have the sudden cardiac death. Hmm, they can have the sudden cardiac death. Now, you should also know what are the risk factors for the development of long QT interval in this patient. So, the patient is on Sotalol. Sotalol is what? Sotalol is your both class 2 and as well as class 3 anti arrhythmic drug. So, this Sotalol is the risk factor here for the individual to develop the long QT interval. Okay. So, 
at this point you should know all the drugs which are causing the long qt interval apart from your sertraline so you can just remember this particular mnemonic that is a b c d e a stands for anti arrhythmics that is amiodarone sertraline and flecainide anti anginal that is ranolazine b stands for antibiotics that is fluoroquinolones macrolides and aminoglycosides c stands for anti psychotics that is haloperidol quetiapine and risperidone D stands for antidepressants that is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants D stands for diuretics E stands for anti emetics that is ondansetron these are all the drugs which will be causing long qt interval so what is our patient had our patient had long qt interval this can progress to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and that can cause sudden cardiac death what is the risk factor here the patient is on sotalol okay right now the next ecg is a very very important ecg which was asked in your aims exam right so before this inict you had this aims exam so this was the ecg asked in the aims exam yes uh, yes obito i will be sending you this pdf i will be sending you this pdf with annotations on my telegram channel right my telegram channel is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba so you can just join this particular telegram channel where i'll be sending this particular pdf with annotations immediately after the class okay right now now uh, yes uh, sana like how to know if we should not give sotalol like we before giving sotalol you have to check the qt interval if the qt interval of the patient is normal then you can give sotalol but if the qt interval is prolonged then you should not give sotalol in that way you should identify whether to give sotalol or not okay right now so what do you think is this particular patient having 31 year old female who is uh, five day postpartum right five day postpartum she was brought to the emergency department following an episode of collapse on arrival to the emergency department she was hypotensive blood pressure is only 80 mm of mercury with an altered consciousness level complaining of chest pain and as well as the headache which well is which vessel is expected to be blocked right coronary artery left anterior descending artery left circumflex artery both left anterior descending artery and left circumflex artery yes right very good so we we have the correct correct answer from the hashirama so the correct answer is the left anterior descending artery now what exactly are, what exactly is this particular pattern so this particular pattern is nothing but these are called d this is called d winter pattern what do you understand by the word d winter pattern d winter pattern means you have an upsloping st segment elevation right you will have an upsloping st segment elevation so the presence of the upsloping st segment elevation with the background history of chest pain and hypotension and where do you have this upsloping st segment elevation mainly within the precordial leads from v1 to v6 in any of these leads you have the presence of upsloping st segment elevation which is called d winter pattern and the presence of the d winter pattern uh, t waves that is suggest you of proximal lad occlusion or that is suggest you of your lad left anterior descending artery occlusion okay so the answer is the lad here so like what is that you are having you are having the peaked anterior t waves and upsloping st segment dip i'm sorry hmm? i'm sorry you are having i'm very sorry you are having the upsloping st segment depression Hmm, upsloping st segment depression right yes uh, hashirama you are 2 3 avf whatever you are seeing here this 2 3 avf what are these these are the opposite leads hmm, these are the opposite leads so whatever you are seeing in 2 3 avf it is the changes which are happening exactly opposite to that of the anterior leads so this we call it as reciprocal changes right yes hashirama is this clear in 2 3 avf whatever you are seeing this st segment depression is your reciprocal changes okay so this is what is your suggest you of d winter pattern where you have lad occlusion right moving to the next question okay so ecg from a 19 year old referred by their general practitioner for investigation of palpitation Hmm, investigation of palpitation 
found at a routine medical review. The, the patient is asymptomatic with no past medical history or regular medication. So diagnosis of this ECG is Mobitz type 2 AV block, Mobitz type 1 AV block, complete heart block, first degree AV block. Hmm? I'll just zoom this ECG, you can answer this. Mobitz type 2, Mobitz type 1, complete heart block, first degree AV block. Yes, what is this suggestive of? Uh, Banu, it is not Mobitz type 1. In Mobitz type 1, what is that you should have, Banu? You should have progressive prolongation of the PR interval. But if you closely observe here, are you having this progressive prolongation of the PR interval? No, you are not having. So, you are having a constant PR interval. Hmm? You are having a constant. PR interval is constant. There is no change in the PR interval. But intermittently, you have a drop in the QRS complex. Hmm? Intermittently, you have drop in the QRS complex. But the PR interval, whatever is there, it is being maintained constant. Again, you have a P wave and drop in the QRS complex. So whatever the arrows have made there, that is the QRS complex which are dropped. So what is this suggestive of? This is suggestive of your Mobitz type 2 AV block. Whereas in Mobitz type 1 AV block in Venkibax, what is that you should have? You should have the presence of, you should have the presence of prolongation of the PR interval followed by drop in the QRS complex. But you don't have that here. You are having constant PR interval with intermittent drop in the QRS complexes, which is suggestive of your Mobitz type 2 AV block. Now, answer this. Now, a 23-year-old male bodybuilder presented following 30 minutes episode of non-exertional chest pain. 30 minutes episodes of uh, non-exertional chest pain. ECG was taken when he was pain-free. What is the Sokolovlione criteria value in this patient? You should, the options are 35 mm, right? The options are 35 mm, 40 mm, 45 mm. 50 mm. Yeah, what is the correct answer here? Right, so the correct answer, if you exactly calculate, it is around 45 mm. It is around 45 mm. Now, let us just try to calculate. So, if you see here, how many how much is your sv1 your sv1 is around sorry sv1 is around 11 mm okay now in between your v5 and as well as v6 which one you should take whichever is taller you have to take hmm? whichever is taller you have to take okay now if you see here 1 2 3 4 that means 20 it's almost like 22 okay and even 1, 2, 3, 4. Even here also 22. So 22 plus 11. So that means how much? It is around 33. I'm sorry. It is not 45. It is nearly 35. I'm sorry. So it is A. Hmm? It is A. So it is around 35. The correct answer is 35 mm. So how do you calculate this? That is SV1 plus RV6 or your RV5. Okay. Okay. So, if you calculate it, it comes around 33 to 35 mm. So, here the answer is 35 mm, right? Now, we'll move on to the next question. This was the question asked in the PGA Chandigarh. Right? This was the question which was asked in your PGA Chandigarh. Now, this ECG is from a 12-year-old boy. What is this ECG suggest you of? Normal ECG, factitious ECG, supraventricular tachycardia, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Yes, I have just zoomed it. Please answer this. Uh, Arshid Banu said SVT. No, it is not SVT. It is not SVT. Hmm? It is not your SVT. Hmm? I have just zoomed this properly. Please go through that. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. No. In Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, you will have this, uh, you know, 
RBBB pattern or you will have tall R wave hmm? tall R wave in V1 that is what you will have in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and this is not even normal ECG also right so this is a factitious ECG now how can you tell that it is a factitious ECG now always remember whenever you get an ECG in your hand you have to look for two important things one is the speed how much should be the speed of the ECG paper 25 mm how much is the speed given here 50 millimeters per second right and what should be the uh, your uh, standardization the standardization should be 10 mm which is correct standardization is correct but if you take the speed it is 50 millimeters per second that is gone okay it should it should not be 50 what should be the speed of the ecg paper 25 mm so that is why it is considered as the factitious ecg hmm? so it is not a normal ecg it is not the ecg with svt it is not your supraventricular tachycardia also right this was asked in your pga chandigarh right and many of the students have made the mistake by answering svt and some students have answered it as normal ecg right but it is a factitious ecg right now the last question hmm? the last question okay right the last question is yes please answer this uh yeah you want to answer this okay fine but you need to be little careful while answering the question hmm? it is not that simple right so a 60 year old male who had an out of hospital cardiac arrest return of spontaneous circulation was attained pre-hospital ecg was done what does it shows lateral wall mi atrial fibrillation ventricular bigemini atrial flutter very good very good samir the correct answer is the ventricular bigemini i'm sorry for that right the correct answer is the ventricular bigemini okay now how to identify that it is ventricular bigemini let me show you so always you have to look for rhythm strip what is rhythm strip lead to is a rhythm strip so you can see here this is the normal qrs complex and this is an ectopic so this is the ventricular ectopic this is a normal qrs complex and this is a ventricular ectopic and this is a normal qrs complex and this is a ventricular ectopic this is the normal qrs complex this is the ventricular ectopic so all these are what this is what is nothing but your ventricular so every second one is an ectopic when every second beat is an ectopic that is nothing but your ventricular bigemini hmm? this is the ecg of ventricular bigemini okay so the correct answer is c right and let me show you one last question and then we'll wind up this session okay right now yes let me see how many of you can answer this uh 70 year old male presented following an episode of the syncope nil significant medical history or medications that means there is no past medical history he complained of the lightheadedness at the time of the clinical review lightheadedness at the time of clinical review blood pressure saturation respiratory rate temperature right all were within the limits okay all were within the limits okay ecg is suggestive of 2 is to 1 av block 1 is to 1 av block 3 is to 1 av block trifascicular block now whenever like these blocks are given like 2 is to 1 1 is to 1 3 is to 1 trifascicular always you have to look for the rhythm strip always you have to look for rhythm strip right so only we have few students answering correctly that is hashirama and as well as arshid banu both of you have answered it correctly the answer is 2 is to 1 av block okay now how can you why will you consider this is a 2 is to 1 av block now if you see very carefully this is a p wave this is a p wave and then qrs complex this is a p wave this is a p wave and then qrs complex okay p wave p wave and then qrs complex p wave p wave and then qrs complex p wave p wave and then qrs complex that means what is that you are having you are having two p waves and one qrs complex so this is what is suggestive of 2 is to 1 av block hmm? this is what is nothing but your 
2 is to 1 AV block, right? So these are some of the very, very important ECGs which have been asked in the previous uh, years. Like these are the ECGs which have been collected from previous NEET PG exam, previous INACT exam, previous AIMS exam, previous PJ Chandigarh exam, okay? Right, now I'll be sending this particular PDF to my Telegram channel, right? My Telegram channel is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. Okay, and if you are not able to find this particular telegram channel, you can text me on my WhatsApp number. I will send you the link of my telegram channel, right? With this, I'll wind up this particular session. I'll take one more session on the ECG before your exams. Yes, Hashirama, your point is very much noted. So I will discuss the treatments of all these particular patterns. Right, I'll discuss the treatments of all these particular patterns. Okay, and if you are, if you want anything more, you can just text me on my Telegram channel because these particular ECGs have been discussed in request to some of the learners whom they have asked me, sir, please discuss the previous year ECGs. Right, you can see that in my Telegram channel. So with their request, I have discussed these particular ECGs of the previous year sessions. So thank you very much. Good night, and see you in the upcoming sessions.